LinkedIn presents. I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. Today, a Stanford professor who thinks the self is an illusion. For some time, I've had an emerging view, shaped in part by conversations we've had on this podcast, that community, broadly defined to include family, friends, colleagues, strangers we meet, is everything. Not 50% of happiness or 75% or 95%, but 100%. There's an analogy in physics. We see the world, at first, as comprised of discrete objects, an atom, a molecule, a teacup, a chair. But if you look more closely, physicists would say matter starts to look more fluid, a web of subatomic particles suspended by the four forces, gravity, electromagnetism, and so on, moving in a kind of flow. In the same sense, we could choose to see ourselves as autonomous individuals, heroically fighting our way through life like explorers with machetes, hacking our way through the jungle, or we can choose to see ourselves as always suspended in a constellation of relationships. Our relationships with other people, in this view, are not just another variable, they are everything. They determine our happiness, our health, our resilience, our success, We talk about individual accomplishments, but in reality, every single accomplishment any of us makes is deeply contingent upon the support and influence of other people. There's no such thing as an autonomous human being, and that's a good thing. If we give up this belief that we're cowboys on the frontier, heroines fighting for glory, and instead see ourselves as teams, tribes, posses, bands, orchestras, If we see ourselves this way, the question is not, can I accomplish this thing? The question becomes, can we accomplish it? Who else shares this same objective? What's the right team to make this happen? Whether it's a business goal, raising kids who flourish, making art, you name it. Maybe, and again, this is just a hypothesis, an alternative framing, maybe, Every single question, every decision is better framed in collective terms. Does money make you happy? To the extent that it strengthens your relationships, yes. To the extent that it isolates you, let's say you win the lottery and all your friends want you to write them a check so you have to hide or you make billions and you need a security team, then no. Should I take this job? Well, if it exposes you to the kinds of people you would like to become, then yes. If not, then probably not. What do we gain if we give up the mirage of individualism? I would argue that we gain everything. More community, more success, more gratification, more more gratitude, more connection, more health, more life. Simply put, as my almost perfect wife and I sometimes say, we have a pronoun problem. Just about every I should be replaced with a we. So when I encountered this book by Brian Lowry, Selfless, The Social Creation of You, where he makes the case that our experience of ourselves is fully defined and constructed by the communities around us, well, I was intrigued. Brian is a professor of organizational behavior at the Stanford Graduate School of Business who has spent the last 25 years studying social psychology. And the startling conclusion he's come to is that selves, and this is a quote, don't emanate from some ineffable light within people. Instead, selves are created in relationships. This claim that there's no you without other people is no doubt controversial, and it's also unsettling. But is it possible that it's also kind of hopeful? That's what Brian is gonna argue in the conversation you're about to hear. He believes by accepting that we are not individual autonomous units, but rather the product of the world we inhabit, we can come to see that life is not a hero's journey. It's an ensemble piece where we can shape others and they can shape us for the better. Mm -hmm. 
The Anxious Achiever is the podcast about your mental health and your work, where leaders from top companies, entrepreneurs, athletes, celebrities, and leading experts share how they've managed through anxiety, depression, and other mental health challenges, and how they've become better leaders in the process. You'll laugh, you'll cry, you'll feel seen, and you'll learn great tools and skills. And I guarantee you're going to look at leadership in a new way. Come find out why we won the Mental Health America 2023 Media Award. Get The Anxious Achiever wherever you find your podcasts. Brian Lowry, welcome to the Next Big Idea podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Rufus. You have a new book out, Selfless, The Social Creation of You. And you is in quotation marks. And that's kind of unsettling. Would you say that this sense that we have, that we are each autonomous, coherent, individual selves, is an illusion? I certainly would. Of course, we have a self. And the question really is, what constitutes that self? And I think people have this sense of something like an essential soul, like something that like came in and it would, all of what they were was already there marked when their body came into existence. And I am pushing against that a little bit. So each of us, you would say, is constructed. I mean, our, our sense of ourselves is constructed in a collaboration with everyone around us. I, I, I love this line you have, if we can choose who we are, we can never do so alone. It seems in some sense so obvious. No, when you go out in the world, who you are is about who you're with. I don't think people have a problem with this when they think about their family or their friends or their romantic partners. So it's, it's really just taking that seriously. What does it mean that the people we're with and grow up with and spend our lives with shape us? What does, that, what does that mean? What does that look like if you push it to the end? Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, we all have this experience of feeling like a different person when we're in the company of different people. And you cite in the early pages of the book some of the sort of psychological history here, right? That there was like Charles Cooley talked about the looking glass self in the early 1900s. And I think you say that George Mead in the 1930s claimed that the self is developed through social interaction. You write, if you couldn't see yourself through the eyes of others, Mead would say, you have no self. Is this view today a, a mainstream view among psychologists or, or is it a divergent view? I think that most psychologists would accept the social construction of self. Um, I think it's, you know, when you get into academia, it's it gets really complex and nuanced. So, most social psychologists would assume that the self is more flexible than the average person. I would say that. I don't know that all of them would go as far as I go in terms of the mm -hmm. <laughs> claim of, so, of complete um, social construction, but I'm certainly not alone in that. Well, this thesis of yours really resonates for me. Um, and and I, I have found this in my own experience to be both true and important. You know, it's a reframing of, of how we think about ourselves, I think, that can make our individual lives and our collective lives a lot better. And, and I find it's nice, Brian, when what you believe to be true, you also think is useful. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> it's nice when it works out that way, isn't not, it? <laughs> right, because it's not always true, right? There's some things I believe to be true that I don't think are useful, but this I think is both true and useful. Um, and an emerging theme on this show has been how deeply intertwined, interconnected, interdependent we are with other humans. We've seen this in how like our happiness and health are so powerfully driven by our relationships. You know, we talked with uh, Surgeon General Vivek Murthy about the loneliness epidemic mm -hmm. and how deeper connections can extend our lifespans by as much as 10 years. We've talked about how we think better in groups. We have these cognitive biases and fallacies that that plague our thinking when we're isolated, but when we think in groups, we think much more clearly. Um, you know, I've had a sort of view that like really all success is group success, that everything we do, whether we're building companies or writing books or doing science, that it's all fundamentally collaborative. And in some cases, like writing a book, maybe collaborative over time with other people, other thinkers. But this thesis of yours takes the importance of community 
uh, a step further in saying it, it's it's not just important to our our health and clear thinking and success. We don't even have a sense of self without these other people around us. It's scary initially, perhaps for for many people, but I think once you you lean into this view, it, it's empowering. I think right. And, uh, do you feel like this reframing is important and useful? I guess is my question. I certainly hope so. <laughs> I, uh, you know, the book is all about it. I, I think people don't fully acknowledge sometimes the importance of communion with other human beings. Mm. That to be human is to be in relationship with other human beings. I think in some ways the kind of individualistic sense that we have in the self of who we are has, has created a kind of narcissism around the self that obscures the importance of relationships. And I think on reflection, it's not hard to see how our relationships, our culture creates the self. I mean, how do we understand how we behave? How do we make sense of who we are? How do we evaluate ourselves? All these things depend on other people. And we, you know, I'm sure we'll get into it, but things like your gender, your race, your nationality, all these things only have meaning in the context of communities, in the context of culture. Um, so when you think about who you are and what affects how you live in the, in the world day to day, it's hard to extricate that from, to separate that from relationships, from the culture you're in. I mean, people are constantly helping us make sense of who we are and in essence, constructing who we are in ways that on, on at first might feel uncomfortable, but I think can be deeply comforting, honestly. Right. The sense that we're sort of suspended in a in a sort of hammock of of our of our sort of collective communities reflection back to ourself of who we are. That this sort of creation of self is is a collective endeavor. And 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 to me, one of the things that I that I was thinking about that that sort of validate this more kind of extreme version of the construction of self is when you look at what happens when people are isolated. You know, you think about solitary confinement and Tom Hanks and Castaway. Wilson, where are you? Wilson! He ends up creating other people in the form of like a volleyball friend or whatever, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. And that it seems that like I, I feel and probably you may feel, uh, probably most people listening feel that my perception of myself is rock solid. Like I could, I feel like I could spend a few years by myself and retain a coherent sense of myself, but all the evidence would suggest otherwise, right? When you isolate people, they they kind of collapse right, mm -hmm. right, psychologically, right? I mean, we're, we're just not able to sustain a healthy, sane understanding of ourselves in the world without interaction. Oh, no. I mean, human beings disintegrate without interaction. I mean, and it's not, again, it's, it's when you think about it, it makes sense. So human beings, I say this sometimes when I teach executives, human beings are soft and weak. When you think about, when you think about nature and other creatures in nature, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't make it very far by ourselves. We're naked. <laughs> we, we're not, again, particularly strong. We're not particularly fast. We're not particularly stealthy. The way that human beings have come to be the dominant species on the planet is through cooperation. I mean, when you think about the complexity of the world we live in, mm, the things yeah. that we depend on day to day, the number of people required to create them, the amount of cooperation is mind boggling. We have evolved to be able to engage with each other in, in such complex ways, in ways that are smooth and ways that that are beyond our own conscious thought, that it's easy to lose sight of it, I think. That we're so practiced at it, it's such a part of what it is to be human that you can forget that it's there. And part of what I'm doing here is reminding people and trying to show people what that looks like in a way that is personal. What it looks like in terms of who you are, not just what we as human beings have done. Yeah, and and we you know we were just talking a, a, a few weeks ago with the psychologist Paul Bloom, and part of what we covered was the really kind of extraordinary porousness of memory, 
right? Like we all have this illusion that our memories are crystal clear and that our memories in some sense we think of as the foundation for this edifice of self, right? Like we, our perception <laughs> of ourselves as these consistent, concrete, coherent entities is built on these memories that we have. But when you dig into memory, it turns out that it's more like a sand dune, right? That, that, a, <laughs> that, a, than a concrete foundation, right? That we just have incredibly fallible memories Every time we kind of reconstruct memories, every time we summon them, mm -hmm. and memories themselves are, are somewhat collaborative endeavors. Yeah, you know, I love the sand dune metaphor. That's great because you know what it also allows is like the the wind of the present will shift your memory. Right? It's mm -hmm. it's like what's happening right now is going to affect how you remember something. You know, a year ago. And people don't have that sense. I think memory feels like, and this is what you're pointing to, it feels like a, a tape recorder or um, like a video camera or something, right? That you put it in there and then when you're ready to play it, you just pull it up and play it back. And when in fact what's happening is you're constructing it each time you remember it. Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, yeah. And if you think of the self as a function of your memories of the past, then you certainly have to think of yourself as incredibly flexible. As you point out, we each have this kind of range of identities, right? And different kind of lenses on ourselves. And these different selves that when invoked can kind of change our behavior. The most extraordinary example of this in your book for me was this study done by social psychologist Margaret Shi about Asian women taking math tests. Do you want to share that study? Sure. So um, Margaret and, and some colleagues did a study where they looked at Asian American women. And the reason they looked at Asian American women is because they have opposing stereotypes about math performance. So Asian Americans are stereotyped to be really good at math and women are stereotyped to be bad at math. And so they were interested in how these conflicting identities could uh, show up in these women's math performance. So what they did is they reminded them either of their gender or their ethnicity and then had them take a math test. And what they found is that the identity they were reminded of affected their math performance. In all cases, they, this, you know, obviously the women were trying to do their best on the math test, but when they were reminded of their gender as compared to their ethnicity, they did worse on the test. And this was seen as a reflection of kind of the the beliefs about those identities, like being Asian American, being good at math, how that affected these women's math performance. And you know, the way I interpret that study is that those women's selves actually shifted and you can see that shift in their performance on this test. And so I, I think it is an incredibly compelling example of how identities actually show up in the way we behave. They're, they're not just ephemeral ways that we think about the self. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, they show up in the world and they show up in how we, how we behave with others, how we behave in, in terms of tasks that are really important to us even. And do you see that, Brian, in, in your own life? I mean, you, you write compellingly in your book about your different identities and your journey. You're the Walter Kenneth Kilpatrick <laughs> Professor of Organizational <laughs> Behavior at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And you know, you're a published author uh -huh. and an incessant asker of questions and a black man. And you know, uh, maybe a cook, and maybe I, I you know, I don't know what mm. <laughs> what other selves you you think of. How do you see these different selves kind of reflected back to you, and how does it affect your your journey? I, I love that question because I don't think my experience is unique. So I hope that people can see this in their own lives. So for me, in particular, when I'm on campus or at a conference, I'm a professor, and I am treat it like a professor and all that entails. The assumptions people make about me and the expectations for how I behave, you know, I'm supposed to be smart and, and say deep things and write books and all, all these things that, you know, are associated with being a professor. And I show up that way. I see myself in that way in those contexts, you know, but when I'm I don't know, walking down the street in San Francisco, I think of myself just as a black man. Like, I mean, this is what people can see about me as I walk down the street. There's no way to see professor in terms of how I look, right? Um, and in those contexts, 
I see myself in that way. Now, it's not as if I don't see myself as a black man while I'm, you know, on campus. It's just that that is not the most prominent identity for me. And it's at times jarring because I recognize the distance between professor and black man for many people. I'm, I'm not confused about that. And I also embody both in different situations. And I reflect on that. I mean, I, I think about what that means and, and how, how I reconcile that and how other people try to reconcile those kind of um, disparate identities that they have, like the Asian American women, right? And, and mm-hmm. at least one domain mm-hmm. of math, it's, it's similar. And I, 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 I'll talk about this a bit. Like, I'll, let me give you an example. It's more concrete in terms of the, the tension this can create. Mm-hmm. So when I was finishing graduate school, which was also a, a transition for me being a, a graduate student, I got a job at Stanford. And what happens is like you're one day a graduate student, you know, a few months later, you move to a different place and now you're a professor. Right. So it's one of those situations that you really, I mean, it's just a hard break. Like you were mm, one thing interesting. Yeah, one day yeah. and then, you know, you show up in a different place and nobody knows you and you're another thing. Yeah. But what's interesting there is that you haven't yet, or I will say I didn't, hadn't yet had the time to internalize what that was or to make sense of it. Yeah. Because it wasn't, yeah. a, often I think it's a gradual kind of process that people have in terms of understanding their identities, people's expectations, how they should behave, you know, all those things kind of happen, but happen slowly and people can acclimate. But there are times when they're just breaks, you know, just shifts. And I remember it being, for me, really difficult. These new views of me were in such tension with the views of me that I had been used to that I was struggling to adapt. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Um, and it was tough, right? I feel like I, I didn't show up in ways that people expected me to because I didn't understand what they saw. Um, Interesting. And I, I talk, when I talk to executives, I say this to them sometimes too, like I, and maybe you've had this experience where mm-hmm. you get a big promotion, let's say, and you feel like your community of the people you were with before is still your community, but now you've been transported into a different, you know, stratum in the organization. Like you're, let's say you're a sweet, sweet, C-suite person now. It, it can be off-putting, I think. Yeah, yeah. And so, I, you know, this is, these are just places where I think you can see the operation of what I'm talking about. Because often this construction of self is so subtle. Um, that you don't really see it operating, but there are times that my guess in most people's lives where they felt it and saw it. Yeah, yeah. My journey has been somewhat different in that I, I, I you know, grew up as a white boy going to a coat and tie all boys school. And I remember going home on the public bus every day and just being kind of ashamed of being this kid in this coat and tie. And so when I got to college, I grew my hair out and was sort of went through kind of a hippie phase, you might say, right? <laughs> I have and are, like are a, you, are you, you went through it? Are you, you, you threw it now, Rufus? Well, no, I'm not, I'm not fully <laughs> through it, Brian. Thank you for asking. Yeah, I've got, I think it's one of my kaleidoscope of identities now, depending on the evening, you know, I've got, but so I had you know, I, 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 much to my mother's dismay, I had my, grew my hair down to my shoulders and had an earring and, you know, <laughs> wore pajama bottoms and cowboy boots and whatever. And I found in that, in those couple of years that people would walk up and talk to me in the train station who would never talk to me. Right. And, and I attracted a collection of people and I repelled other people, including my mother's friends. <laughs> right? uh, but, uh, and then I, you know, one day I, cut my hair short again. And I could see in the weeks that followed that people treated me differently. And I became, and my behavior changed because, I mean, there was this sort of assumption that, oh, I was this, you know, clearly laid back, probably pot smoking, ruminative, non-judgmental person into probably certain kinds of music. There were a bunch of assumptions people made about me when I presented myself to the world with long hair and certain certain clothing. Uh, and when I 
presented myself differently, those assumptions completely changed and involuntarily my behavior changed. You know, uh, and, and I just remember how how kind of uh, surreal that was to, to, to feel the impact of, of, of the way that my appearance reflected back to me and, and it uh, in turn changed my behavior. That's a, a powerful example. And the way I make sense of that is that the hair and the way you dress were markers of the communities you belong to. Yeah. And people want to engage with members of their community. And so, you know, one, one, representation of you, like your short hair and your jacket and tie, you know, marked you as belonging to a community and those people engaged with you in a particular way. And when you grew your hair out, you in some sense left that community and joined another. Yes, And that yes. changed your behavior too. Yeah, I think this idea of community is in- incredibly important um, in part because what I focus on in the book is those communities define define you, right? It's not, it's not the yep. whole world, yep. it's the communities you belong to. And also, I don't talk about this that much in the book, but it's just, it also reflects the the tribal nature of human beings. Yeah. Which yeah. is, you know, in many ways, deeply troubling. It's the, you know, the the dark side of the embracing community. And so it's also not surprising that your mom's friends would be repelled. <laughs> yeah. I think that that is the the flip side of the embrace of of a new community, like people walking up to you at the train station. And again, those communities will change how you think about yourself and will change who you, the way you behave. Yeah, yeah. And it's a privilege to be able to choose to move between different communities, right? I mean, not everyone always feels that they have the luxury or, or the, the flexibility to move between communities. And certainly in, in my own life, it feels to me like having a range of different communities and different friends is helpful in exploring a, a more complete experience of, of of humanity. I agree completely. Like I would, I would go further and say that it's glorious to engage with other people and other communities, in part because you can have this confusion that you see the world as it is, and the way you live is a reflection of the only way the world can be. But the reality is like every person is living in a different world. I mean, their experiences, how the world treats them, what they see when they look out into the world, everyone has these, these vastly different experiences. And when you engage with people, it gives you a window into another world. Um, and when you are a part of different communities, it allows you to see the richness of what can be, like what people can be in ways that you, you know, you probably just become accustomed to what people can be in your community. And that's not the only thing that people can be. Other communities allow different things. One of the things I'd I'd like people to get from the book is just how much we leave on the table when we don't deeply engage with other people. Like we're being influenced by them, whether we intend to or not, but to engage deeply, to talk to people, to be curious about their experience, mm, yeah, yeah, really just has the potential to open your life up in ways that are hard to describe. I'm curious, Brian, how far do you take the argument that we have no essential self? Well, there's a line in the book where I say, you know, I, I did what I always do. I made the most extreme argument possible. So <laughs> put that in <laughs> mind. Right, 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 right. It's a, there's a, there, there might be a pinch of devil's advocacy here or, or of, of a, uh, a contrarian impulse. A little bit. Um, I'm very serious about there being no essential self, which is different than saying there's no self. When people engage with me, I think I influence them. I think it's myself that influences them. I just don't think that myself is some essential thing (laughs) that is uh, somehow insulated from others. Hi, I'm Jonathan Fields. Tune into my podcast for conversations about the sweet spot between work, meaning, and joy. And also listen to other people's questions about how to get the most out of that thing we call work. Check out Spark wherever you enjoy podcasts. 
Hey folks, Rufus here. If you're a fan of our interviews with physicians, scientists, or entrepreneurs, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights and actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, an AI expert and in Citro CEO, Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health wherever you get your podcasts. Let's talk about how your theory about our inherent selflessness impacts our identities in terms of race and gender. Yeah, so, you know, those kind of identities, what people would think of as social identities, right? Identities that are explicitly about who you're connected to, who, who, you're, and who you're like, right, and who you're not like, right? Um, I'm a Black person because I'm like other Black people. I belong in that category. Um, that my claim is that it's not a choice that you make, that it's a acceptance by that community of a claim, meaning that I'm Black because I do think of myself as being Black and because the community that it defines that identity accepts me as Black. That's what makes me Black. It's not really about my biology, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that it's about people's acceptance of me as a member of that group. And I think this is really has become a flashpoint when you think about gender. People are having a really hard time with this decoupling, the separation of gender as a, a social identity from biological sex. You know, what's interesting, by the way, is that there's less of that in the context of race, right? I think that some people who would not only accept, but argue pretty strongly for people's ability to define themselves as a gender, even if it doesn't match their biological sex match. Mm -hmm. I understand that that could be controversial for some people, but I think most people know what I mean there. Those same people that would argue for trans people's right to identify with whatever gender they'd like would probably not be okay with people being able to self-identify their race. <laughs> Well, and we have a case study of this, don't we, with, with Rachel Dolezal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For listeners who aren't familiar, you may want to share the backstory there. Yeah. So um, Rachel Dolezal was a, a woman in, that came to be, I want to say, the head of the NAACP in Spokane. I believe it was Spokane. Mm -hmm. So she identified as Black. The community accepted her as Black. Um, she uh, was married to a Black man, had a child that everyone identifies as black and was really active in the community around issues important to black people. And then it came out that her parents were both white. So she was, when she was born, she was by all accounts, a white child. People were really upset because they felt lied to. They felt like she had pretended to be black and her claim and, and last I heard, she's, this is still her her claim, is that she she feels like she's black. She's in her mind, she's always felt like she was black and that she believes that her sense of herself as black and her commitment to the black community makes her a black person. And others <laughs> obviously do not agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, and the position that I take is that she was a white, she was born a white person she was a white child and then she became a black woman. Not she was a white woman or a white person that looked like and pretended to be black, but she became a black woman because she saw herself as a black woman and the community embraced her as a black woman. And now she is a not black woman, is what I would say. Yeah. That she yeah. that the community has um the community that she wants to be embraced by or accepted into as a black person now rejects her. And therefore, yeah. she is no longer a black woman. And, and, and in this sense, as you say, that Rachel Dolezal was born a white girl, became a black woman as she was accepted by the community as being mm -hmm. a black woman, and then was rejected to some degree by the community. And as a consequence, her, her identity changed, changed again. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, what's interesting about biology, I think the confusion is we use our understanding of biology to make decisions about who is and who isn't a part of the group in terms of race in the United States. And we confuse what we use to make the decisions with what's driving what you are. Meaning that if I look at you and I believe you don't have any bio, you're not, there's no biological blackness in you, then I think you're white. What makes you white is not the absence of biological blackness. It's my belief that you're not black. Does that make sense? It's a yeah, subtle distinction, yeah. but I think an important one that it's, it's not, it doesn't really matter why I think you're black or not black. What matters is that I think you're black or not black. Yep. And, and, and this also maps pretty clearly onto the, some of these questions about gender and sex, right? And, and I mean, what, one can understand why there might be some members of the, of the black community who may say, hey, Rachel, it's great that you would like to be a member of our community, but this was sort of a choice that you've elected to make from at least their perspective. And not all of us, you know, make these sort of... Uh, decisions to move between these identities. I mean, J.K. Rowling seemed to make a similar, have a similar opinion about, about sex and gender, right? Where, where she quite, you know, very controversially said, hey, this notion that we can no longer identify women as people who menstruate does a disservice to, to me as a woman and, 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 and biological women who feel that we've had a specific kind of experience as a result of our biology. Um, and and she, she felt, I guess, that her identity was being impinged upon by this kind of new, more open and fluid definition of what it means to be a woman. I mean, are, those, are those sort of analogous, do you think? I think they are. And at the risk of getting myself in trouble, I, I, well, I don't agree with the positions. I understand them. Right? Yeah. People guard their groups. Um, yeah. I mean, they guard their groups because those group distinctions define them, right? If I think of myself as a man and I let people redefine what it means to be a man, that that has direct relevance to my understanding of myself. That's deeply personal. And so when people feel like the integrity of their racial group is being challenged or impinged on, or they feel like people are trying to change what it means to be a man or a woman, people are going to take that pretty personally, I would argue. And I understand that. I really do, because it is personal. And when people are challenging those kind of boundaries, I think they should recognize that it's not, what, they, what they're doing is not just a personal decision. It really does affect other people in terms of how they see themselves. If when Rachel decides she's black or tries to decide she's black, I would say like, you know, if she's accepted by the black community, I, I would accept her as black, right? That That is not a problem. But when she's doing that from a certain place, it is, and it, and it challenges how others make sense of themselves. Like if they think being black is not having a choice, it's being subject to what it means to be black in America. And if you're not, that's not been your life experience then you're not black because that challenges how I understand myself, what it means to me to be black. So when Rachel makes that decision, she's challenging other people's understanding of themselves. Yeah, yeah. And that's going to create backlash. That's going to upset people. And same thing with um, trans folks when they say like, no, I, I didn't have, let's, let's say you're talking to J.K. Rowling. No, I didn't grow up with this experience. No, I didn't have these um consequences of my biology early on in my life, but I still am a woman, J.K. Rowling is going to be upset. And she is, right? Because it challenges what it means to be a woman the way she understands herself. And those things are, I think, rightly understood in some sense as personal challenges, which is not to say that people shouldn't be able to make those decisions. It's just an honest point to make that it's not an individual choice to claim a certain identity. It's a claim about the community and that identity within that community. It's a claim about what it is to be black. Not that just you are black, but you're making a claim about what it should mean to be black, uh, what it means to be a woman, like who can be a woman. And I don't, sometimes I don't think that that 
aspect of it is taken seriously enough. You talk about the necessity of the community having a conception of a given identity, right? And that and that, that it, it, it's 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 necessary to to be able to have a a shared imagined conception of these identities and how this was manifested in the emergence of the nation state and how technology affected this. And I, I was fascinated by this that I think the argument w- was uh, put forth by an author named Benedict Anderson that the printing press allowed for the foundation of nation states, right? And that it wasn't until a collection of people could share a conception of themselves as one people in a singular nation that nations became possible. Um, and that this te- this teaches us something about what is required for shared identities to to emerge. Yeah, I find I find that I, the whole kind of history of nation states really interesting. Like I'm, you know, I'm not a political scientist, but I think the idea that nation states are relatively new um, inventions, right? Like they're call it between two and three hundred years old, and they're not really just an evolution or direct um, evolution of tribes or something like that. Um, they're like new creations. It's that that is it's kind of amazing when you think about it because they <laughs> nations organize the world, and it's hard to imagine what it would be, how the world would be without nations. And and yet yeah, it's only it's relatively new, the concept. And to your point about what that tells us, I mean, that you can feel connected and I don't, I don't know how patriotic you are, but I, I assume, and maybe this, I assume you see yourself as an American. Is that right? Do you see yourself I do. as an American? I, okay. I, okay. I do. Yeah. I see, I see myself <laughs> as an American. I, I, I would say I've had uh, waxing and waning uh, degrees of patriotism over time, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> but you know, but the idea that you can see yourself as an American in some sense is amazing, right? You can see yeah. yourself as defined by and connected to hundreds of millions of people. Yeah. There's, there's something really profound about that. Um, and it just, it says something about the flexibility of human communities, right? Or what's possible in terms of the construction of human communities. Like, what does it mean to be an American? I mean, it means more than that. And I talk about this in the book. It doesn't really just mean American citizenship. You mean something more than that. It's not just, it is a legal concept, but I think when people say, I feel like an American, I assume you're saying more than just, I can have an American passport. It's a feeling of connection to the concept of America and to the people that make it up. Um, And that that really, I don't know, I I find that really both mundane because it's such a part of how the world is organized and how we live, but also amazing when you reflect on it. John Lennon said, count your age by friends, not years. I've always liked this quote, and I've tried to apply it. Always be building new friendships, expanding communities. And I've tried to apply the same approach to the process of learning. Always be learning, ingesting new ideas, testing my assumptions. But where can you find a flow of the best new ideas vetted by experts? There is so much noise out there. I'm so glad you asked. This is why we started the Next Big Idea Club. We've partnered with hundreds of the world's leading nonfiction authors to create audio summaries of their books. We call these summaries Book Bites, and our app features a new one every single day. You can listen to a book bite in 12 minutes or read it in five. There's no other place on the planet where you can listen to book summaries created by authors themselves. And that's not all we have waiting for you when you download the Next Big Idea app. We also have video and audio masterclasses, ad-free versions of this podcast, new original audiobooks, and tons of other member benefits. So what are you waiting for? Open your app store, search for the Next Big Idea. There is no better way to get smart fast. Download the Next Big Idea app right now. Well, turning to what our listeners and readers of your book can kind of take away from this kind of reframed view of 
how our sense of ourselves is socially created. What do you think are the big takeaways? And I'll, I'll share a couple a couple things that have occurred to me. We're less free than we think, and that could be perceived as bad news. We're more dependent on others in so many ways, including just just to have a coherent sense of ourselves. But it also means that we influence others more than we think. And, and with that comes a greater responsibility. How should this reframed view of selfhood change our behavior? So I think there's also, in giving up a little freedom, people might gain a, a, a measure of um, maybe compassion for themselves, or mm. maybe they can let go of a little bit of anxiety that it's not all, it's not all about you, right? That it's yeah, the, yeah. the environment you're in. And um, of course you should still, I think, because we're human and people need a sense of agency, do the best that you can. But the idea that your outcomes are wholly dependent upon you, that just cannot be true. So I think there's some maybe relief that people should take from that. Um, I think, the responsibility that you pointed out, pointed to is really important to me that when you engage with someone else in, a, in at least a small way, you're constructing who they are. And there's a deep responsibility associated with that. And I think that responsibility actually um, can be, or can at least lead to um, some enjoyment in interactions with other people. When I talk about this book, and maybe this says something about me, when I when I give talks uh, about it, or um, when, I, when people ask me questions about it, I feel like <laughs> afterwards I, I behave in a I behave in a way that I'm I'm more proud of that I think mm. I'm a better person after I talk about the book <laughs> because it reminds me of something that I forget all the time, right? It, it it reminds me of the importance of my engagements with other people. Yes. And I think that I engage yeah. a little bit more seriously in ways that aren't hard or not fun. In fact, they can be more fun, but I feel so much more enjoyment um, and, and engagements with people and much more compassionate with people after I talk about the book in part because it reminds me mm-hmm. of the importance of those engagements. It reminds me of my responsibility to those, those people. And when I engage with people that way, they give me something back. And so I think if people left with that, if people were really a bit more thoughtful about their engagements with others and felt a bit more responsibility, even the fleeting engagements, I would, I'd, I'd feel great about that. And I think if people feel that way, I think they'll be surprised what they get in return, actually. I love the way you, you end the book by reminding us that one of the benefits of this kind of distributed view of identity, of, of ourselves, is that we exist through the impressions we make on everyone around us, you know, through this kind of distributed impact we have. And in this sense, we live on, not literally as a spirit of some kind, but but through these kinds of ripples or the wake that we leave. Uh, and, and I think that's that's kind of beautiful. In some ways, people understand this, right? Because people desire to have an impact on others' lives that outlive them, right? That, out, that outlive their own, their own presence here. Human beings desire a connection. And when they think about their own physical demise, actually increase their sense of connection to communities. You could imagine it going the other way, right? When you think about your own demise, maybe communities don't matter that much because you won't be here. But it turns out that the opposite is true, that people feel more connected to symbols of their communities when they think about their eventual demise. And mm, I think that's in large part yeah. because people desire some some sense of immortality through their connections with other people, through their connections to their communities. So interesting. Well, and you say you say in in some of the in some of the final paragraphs, uh, when we die, we hope others mourn us, but perhaps we also create space for them to expand. And then you say, our very presence makes others and then makes demands. Maybe we should strive to give generously and leave gracefully, which really made an impact on me. This notion that we, we give people the gift of our presence, and then at some point we give them the gift of our absence. And then they can choose to take what they like from whatever we've had to offer. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, there's something beautiful about what we give people when we're here. But, and this is, this is exactly what you just read, but what we give them also makes demands, right? We, you cannot be in a relationship that doesn't make a demand of someone else. Um, and of course, you hope that what you provide in return more than um, justifies the demands that you make of them. Um, but at some point, you know, it, it may be nice to free people of those demands. Now, I can't resist ending on a slightly lighter note, which is <laughs> one, of the, one of the responses I had to your book was having a desire to kind of do more ex sort of experiments in exploring the breadth of human communities that exist and our own role we can have in them. And one, one kind of somewhat funny experience I had uh, in my early 20s is I took a year off from college and I, um, and, and I went out to Colorado and I was a ski bum. <laughs> and uh, somehow, by the way, somehow Rufus, this is like painting a very clear picture of you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, this is one of my half dozen or dozen <laughs> different identities, right? And I managed to get a job as a ski instructor by day. And so I'd put on my ski instructor jacket and I, you know, I still had the long hair and, and with the little Velcro and the Rufus. And then, but then it, in the evenings, I was a pizza delivery guy. And so I would take off the ski instructor jacket, which had a certain, you know, kind of cachet. You have a little, a little bit of swagger in your stride when you're wearing the <laughs> ski instructor jacket. I take that off and put on my pizza delivery guy jacket. <laughs> <laughs> also with the Velcro and the Rufus, you know, and I'd be coming up to a house with a nice steaming pepperoni pizza. And I'd hear a kid say, mom, mom, it's the pizza guy. You know, and I'd look around and think, that's me. <laughs> I'm the pizza guy, you know, and uh, and I'm I I I I felt like a cross between Santa Claus and the garbage man, you know, because it's sort of like, <laughs> on the one hand, you're kind of delivering joy with the pizza as a pizza guy, but you're also, you know, it's not necessarily the most respected uh, role <laughs> in society. But I met all kinds of, of course, a co totally different cast of characters, uh, you know, delivering pizza, and the richness of that of the, this breadth of experience. Uh, I'm trying to encourage my kids to try on a lot of different jobs if they can. The different ways and roles we can have in the world and ways of interacting with people um, result in different experiences of ourselves and different experiences of others. Uh, no doubt. And I, I love this image of Rufus, the ski instructor, and Rufus, the pizza delivery guy. Somehow, <laughs> the name Rufus works for both. <laughs> <laughs> We've got some elasticity with, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, actually I, I had, um, in college, I had, I had a lot of jobs. So I, I worked as a, um, I worked in, as a bellhop. I worked okay, as yeah. a, uh, in the produce department. Uh, yeah. I worked at a, I clean cars. I worked as a yeah. night security guardman at a solo cup factory. I also at one point could sell you your books tutor you in the subject and then take your ticket at the at the party at night <laughs> <laughs> so well, i too go. have had many many um kind of like little part-time jobs everything from yeah telemarketing i did i've done yeah, a lot wow. of things and uh it's uh it's funny to think about how how different those those things right. are right well um brian uh thank you so much for taking time out of your your busy life uh, to be with us today. We uh, just so enjoy the conversation. Thanks for having me. I really, I really appreciated the conversation too. It was fun. That was Brian Lowry, professor at Stanford Graduate School of Business and author of Selfless, The Social Creation of You. In addition to coming on the show, Brian has done something really special for us. He's created a 15-minute audio summary of the book where he breaks it down into five key insights. We call this a book bite, and the only way to hear it is by downloading the Next Big Idea app. Once you've got our app installed, you can listen to Brian's book bite and hundreds more from authors like Gretchen Rubin, Adam Grant, Walter Isaacson, and more, a new one every day. Download the Next Big Idea app today. Are you enjoying this show? If you are, we really appreciate it if you leave us a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It may not seem like much, but 
It helps us get the word out. And have you checked out the original audiobook we just released with Steven Johnson? It's called Immortality, A User's Guide, and you can find a link to download it in the episode notes. It's about the extension of the human lifespan. Today's show was produced by Caleb Bissinger, sound design by Mike Toda. I wouldn't have a podcast yourself without the good people at LinkedIn or without you, dear listener. Thank you for listening. I'm Rufus Griscom. See you next week.